better because I hate being right behind the podium. So, uh, well, first of all, I just want to share with you all that uh, I'm coming tonight to try to present to you uh, some of the facts that I've learned over the last 25, 30 years that I've been involved in this industry. I'm not here representing South Carolina Department of Transportation. I'm not even here really representing my company because this is just stuff that I've gained and learned. Um, and I want to present this to you this evening kind of in a factual basis. I am a Republican. I uh, always have been and probably always will be. The Republican Party stays, uh, stays true to its, uh, to its word. Uh, and so that I do have opinions on these things and what needs to be done and what happens. But I'm also torn from the standpoint I've been in the industry and seeing that as well. So I want to present to you all a little bit of a history, kind of, of what's going on and what's happening. Um, and then also just allow you to ask questions as we go along. There may be some things I don't know. Um, as I say, I'm not involved in the infant details daily within the DOT. I've never worked for the DOT. Um, and by no way am I representing them here uh, this evening. But uh, what I do know is that uh, our infrastructure across the nation is in a state of crisis. And unfortunately, we are seeing that same problem here in South Carolina. But there are challenges out there, and I deal with them on a daily basis. I have a unique perspective, one that not many people have, in the fact that this is actually me. <laughs> and every bridge that you drive over in the state of South Carolina is over four feet deep in more than four feet of water I have been under. I've been diving in the state doing underwater bridge inspections since 1998 had the opportunity to go to bridges multiple times uh, and, and view them underwater. So it is somewhat of a unique perspective, seeing a portion of our infrastructure that others don't uh, usually get to see, typically get to see. And most time people say, well, how do you see it? And typically I feel it. Uh, usually if we can see our hand in front of our face down under the water, uh, it's a good day. It's a good day. But uh, it is an enjoyment. Usually what I do is I raise my hand, I ask people to uh, to ask you if you drove across a bridge coming to my lecture. Did anybody drive across a bridge? Probably came across the bridge just because you came off the interstate there. Now, how many of you all stopped before you got to that bridge and worried whether or not it was going to fall down? Okay, we're doing our job right. We're doing our job right. <laughs> we're trying to keep that infrastructure safe. We're trying to keep that infrastructure safe. And part of that is obviously the funding. They can't, they can't do this in a vacuum. So let me see if this works. All right, you know, back in the turn of the century, the first, uh, the turn of the century, a century ago, this is what our roads looked like. And I'm not sure if people were complaining then about a gas tax. Probably didn't even have that. Didn't even have a gas tax back then. But the roads were pretty bad. We fast forward to today. We look. People paid lots of money to put vehicles in these types of roads. Isn't that right? I mean, you have to pay all kinds of dollars to get out and look at these things. Uh, and have big jacked up trucks to be able to go on those same roads that 100 years ago we drove in. Well, today, most of the people are dealing with, uh, are dealing with problems like this. You know, our potholes in our deteriorating roads, our bridges that are crumbling and potentially falling apart, the maintenance that is a challenge out there, the traffic that backs up on 85, on 26, on 385, even on our rural routes and our, uh, our uh, connectors, um, just lots of challenges that we are facing within the transportation industry. And our DOT is faced with those challenges daily. You know, and it's how do we fix them? How do we fix them? How do we go about making sure that our roads and bridges are safe and that our roads and bridges are up to speed and our roads and bridges are having the, the amount of uh, capacity that they need? You know, unfortunately, in a state like this, we've had roads and bridges for a long, long time. That's a positive thing. The bad part about it is we haven't been able to plan for the extreme growth that we've had over the years. Other states have been more fortunate. I know when we, my wife and I went, uh, first got married, we lived in Kansas City. And I remember driving on a beltway on the outside of Kansas City, six lanes wide, going, why in the world do they need this? When we go back and visit there now, that place has grown up like crazy, and those six lanes are almost full of capacity. But they saw the foresight to be able to expand to that because they didn't have lots of things there. They could just plow through the farmland and put that road in and the people came. That's not always the case here on the East Coast. We've had people there, we've had centers of commerce, we've had centers of challenge. And our industry, our livelihood, our lives depend on good transportation. 
we are a little unique in the U.S. in the fact that we like our roads and we like our, our independence with the vehicles that we have. You go to Europe, I've been to Europe several times, I did a study abroad over there, they don't depend on their vehicles as much. They use mass transit a lot more and their vehicles are no fun to drive because they're all small little vehicles and the majority of them are stick shifts. You know, that is kind of fun, particularly in Ireland when you have to shift with your left hand. But uh, <laughs> it, they, they just don't, they don't have that American spirit that we have, the love that we have for our cars. The roads and bridges are integral to what we have and we need to make sure we're fixing them. But unfortunately, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Unfortunately, money doesn't grow on trees. Unfortunately, there is a limited amount that we have out there, and that amount does come from taxes, from taxes that we have. And as we all say, and you know, and, and many people say, taxes were taxed, were taxed, were taxed. Uh, but unfortunately, the money that is needed to be able to improve does come from this. So let's talk a little bit about how our taxes are being spent. And predominantly, what we're looking at here, the majority of the money for our infrastructure, our roads, and our bridges comes from gas tax. Every time you go to the pump, you're not, you, don't, you, you are filling up uh, that dollar amount, whether it's 285 now, or it used to be 169, or a couple years ago it was 385 or 402, or whatever it was, includes a portion of gas tax. Many of you all are very familiar with that and aware of that, and that's been a hot topic that we've been talking about. But let's make sure that each one of you understands where it comes from, this gas tax. First of all, we had the federal gas tax. This was first enacted in 1956. We've been with this for a long time. The most recent increase happened in 1993, where we went to 18.4 cents. Every, every gallon that you fill up, Diesel's a little more, so if you rise up to drive a diesel vehicle, uh, like my wife and I do to get our seven children around, uh, we, uh, we pay 18.4 cents to the federal government on our gas tax. Per gallon. Per gallon. Per gallon. Per gallon. 84 cents per gallon. So it's not a percentage, it's not like a sales tax. For a sales tax, the sales tax fluctuates with inflation. Something that costs a dollar today, Cost two dollars later for six percent sales tax, the state doubles in that amount. But the gas tax is more of a tax that's, that's on just on just on per gallon, and so <laughs> over time, over time, it actually has less value or less purchasing power because it doesn't keep up with inflation. Talk a little bit more about that here. Here in South Carolina, we have to go back to uh, 1996 when the last gas tax was, was enacted, and it was raised to 16.8 cents. It's, if we say 16 cents um, is really what it is, there's a little bit more uh, that's included on a couple of things there, about 16.8 cents. So here in South Carolina, for every gallon that we fill up, we're paying 16.8 cents to the state, um, using that in the state. That's the two main components that we're seeing coming out of the gas tax. So all of those people driving through the state that come here, develop there, they're paying part of both the federal as well as the state tax. And lots of people, we live up in Landrum, lots of people come across the border. I feel sorry for all of the uh, try on exit uh, gas stations, they're out of business because you drive five miles down the road and you save a lot more money. And the reason is this right here. I'll leave this up here for a minute. This is the gas tax, including the 18.4 cents federally, where we see it in all creation. So if we look here in South Carolina, we have about a 35 cent gas tax. We look at our neighbors to the north, 56 cents. We look at our, our neighbors to the west and south, 46 cents. Even in, in Florida, 54 cents. So all those people coming up 95, where do they want to stop for gas? South Carolina. I can tell you right now, even though there's states that have very high, the one right here being Pennsylvania, a lot of work in Pennsylvania, their infrastructure is not in bad shape, even though they've got a super high gas tax. They've got lots of challenges with their infrastructure. So just because you've got a high gas tax doesn't necessarily equate to the highest gas tax equals less problems in your infrastructure. There's still problems. 
So if we look at this, the gas tax on the federal level actually goes into what we call the Highway Trust Fund. Anybody heard of that before? Highway Trust Fund. Okay. That is a fund that was set up to collect all the money. And essentially what it's doing is it distributes that money back out to the states. And I'll get into the details of that in a little bit. The challenge is that Highway Trust Fund, you may have heard, is becoming insolvent has become insolvent and is becoming continued to be insolvent um, unless the federal government keeps injecting money into it. And it's because of this problem, because we're collecting only 18.4 cents, and part of the problem is the fact that, uh, that costs continue to go up. One of the reasons why we, we did uh, the Cooper River Bridge down in Charleston, what we call a design build, is to get it built quicker and sooner so the cost didn't escalate to capture those costs today so that five years, 10 years, if it took that long to design it and build it, that the cost didn't go up by a significant amount. And so we're seeing that problem across the nation where those costs go up and the money is getting spent too quickly and our highway trust fund is becoming insolvent. So if there's not a permanent fix to that, we're gonna continue as a nation to have to infuse money into the highway systems to be able to support some of the needs that the, the federal bill has. If we look at this and we look back at the cost, here's just a kind of a reinforcement. In 1993, postage stamp was 29 cents. Here was the last time we had a gas tax increase within the state here in 1996. Um, and we look here, gallon of milk, 214, 241. Even gas was $1.20, including the tax, or $1.11. It went down a little bit in 1996. You know, we're nowhere close to these numbers today. So we have seen an increase in the value. The other challenge that we face is that our cars have gotten more fuel efficient. 1996, of course I've chosen Crown Vic here, it's about 10, 8, 7, 6 miles for the gallon. And you have a smart car here, and who knows how much they you know, get, 60, 70 miles for the gallon. Or you get the electric vehicles that don't have gas at all. And the fact that people are not buying as much gas per person per mile driven as we did back in 96 or 93. And so that's seen a decrease in our revenues, seen a decrease in the revenues that we have out there. And so that's a reason why when we say, hey, we can't uh, spend as much, uh, we don't have as much money to spend anymore, it's not just due to the inflation, but it's also to the decrease due to our more fuel efficient vehicles uh, that we have uh, going on our roads. Oregon is attempting to do something to try to get around that. Instead of taxing people by gallons they purchase, they're actually taxing them. It's a voluntary system right now, but they may go mandatory of putting a little GPS tracker and putting on how many miles you rode, you, you drive. And how many people think that's a violation of personal liberty? You know, tell me where, where I went, where I drove. I don't want that. I'm glad that I don't live in Oregon and have to be faced with that potential problem in the future. But they're seeing. Uh, that so many fuel efficient vehicles that they're seeing huge decreases in the revenue stream coming from the gas tax. So if we look at this, the South Carolina collects the federal gas tax from each one of the gallons that is done, it submits it to the federal government, and then the federal government distributes it back out. One of the reasons that the Federal Highway Administration was set up is try to bring the entire nation up to a common level, up to a common level on uh, on their um, roads and bridges. So they distribute that money back out to the states. And in order to do that, they do that through the federal highway bill. And that bill puts out how much money a state is going to get. Some states are donor states, meaning they're putting more money in than they get back. Some states are donee states where they get more money. South Carolina, we're about even. We're about even. About as much money as we put in is about as much money as we get out. If we look at that, there are some limitations, though, on that money coming back to us. The problem is, that for every 80 cents that they give us in federal dollars, we have to come up as a state with 20 cents. For every dollar spent, 80, 80 cents is the federal government, 20 cents is put together by the states. And there are certain limitations on the types of projects. Most of them are required different types of, of, of uh, bridges and roads that can be used on those limitations. We'll talk a little bit about that. But if we look specifically at South Carolina, we have a challenge here. We are 40th by land area, but we're the fourth largest state-owned road system. We don't have a lot of county-owned bridges. 
in a lot of county-owned roads or municipality-owned. The state has taken those over years ago, and so the state owns and operates a majority of all of our roads and bridges and has lots of uh, requirements there to spend. If we look at actually the state system itself, through here, these are our lane miles, our center line miles, being down the center of the road, and this is, we have multiple lanes, uh, some 41,000 center lane miles that we have. That's the fourth largest in the U.S. Pretty amazing for a small little state like us that the DOT owns and operates. We look specifically at the budget, 2015 budget in South Carolina. And we look at, I mean, I'm sorry, this is the, uh, the revenue stream, where revenue is coming from um, and, and what we're doing here. Uh, this is where the revenue comes. You have different types of motor, motor fuel that we have in here. This is the federal aid uh, projects that we have here from the federal government. Some $1.5 million, a billion dollars, this is all in millions, put down at the bottom here. Uh, and this is where it's all coming from. But a majority of that is coming from our, both our South Carolina tax as well as reimbursements from the federal government. If we look at this, though, we have to spend a lot of money in order to take this 20%. And that's the challenge that the state faces. The federal government is standing there with their hand out saying, we're going to give you 80 cents on the dollar, or 80 cents for every project that you have, as long as you can come up with your 20. And so the DOT is spending a lot of the resources to come up with that 20, because they hate to turn away the 80, 80 cents. Some states do that. Some states walk away from that and can't do that at the end of the day, and they leave money on the table that the federal government can give them. We don't do that here in South Carolina. We try to take as much as we can. The problem is that uh, when we look at that, some, there are some restrictions on that. And so if we see the actual spending that is being spent, we're looking at the federal program, the overall federal program, we're spending some uh, almost a billion dollars on the, with the federal program and our matching dollars uh, to what's being spent. Look at this right here, even $300 million in all maintenance and all the rest. Uh, but I do want to point out a couple of, uh, a couple of things here that uh, uh, that we have here, just even administrative and engineering is 85 million, um, and general administration is 81 million. So our uh, revenue stream, lots of it is going to the federal program, or the federal matching program. If we look at our nation's bridges, South Carolina does have a large number of structurally deficient bridges, over 1,000. We have over 8,000 bridges, over 1,000 structurally deficient. Doesn't mean they're unsafe, just means that we need to spend some money on them to get them back up to speed. Of that. You can see some numbers across the nation there. We're not the worst, but we're obviously not the best. If we look at our interstate system and we look at the fact that um, um, of the 3,000 lanes here, we have 61% are in good condition. Uh, the problem is this has huge truck volumes on it and nearly 20% of all of our travel in South Carolina is on our interstate system. If we look at our uh, primary systems, all of these are federal aid eligible, meaning that they're eligible for matching dollars, that 80 to 20%. If we look at this here, we've got uh, uh, another 47% uh, on our primary systems. You can see we're starting to get in, in, in poor condition in our roadway systems, our pavement systems. Uh, they are all now. But here's the true story that we have. Our secondary systems, some of them we can spend the federal money on, some we cannot. Some 2,000 or 20,000 center lane miles we cannot use federal funds on. And so what happens is that 7% of our travel occurs on these 20,000. And there's many times not a lot enough money left over. By the time we match the 20% on all of these dollars, on all of these dollars for our federal projects, this is the year it gets done. So people ask me a lot of times, why are we not, why are we not paying in that road, that little county road? Why are we not taking care of that? And this is one of the reasons why. At the end of the day, sometimes this is left over. And this is a it, it, challenge because really, we've got 7% of our travel is only occurring on these roads. Not that that's a good thing. Not that that's a good thing if these are left, but sometimes the priorities have to be in other areas. If we look, if this is our gas tax and this is our uh, federal money that's coming in, there are other revenue streams. And I specifically want to talk about some of them here and the fact that these are approved by the legislator, legislation and provided to us. 
And in recent years, they've done a, done a great job to the DOT in providing some. One was happened in uh, a couple of years ago, Act 98, where they set aside $50 million for certain types of projects, including some of those uh, local and county road uh, projects that uh, need to be repavements, put together some specific money for bridges um, and different projects that are associated to help out. The other area, and I know sometimes this is controversial, is the State Infrastructure Bank. These were set aside back in 1997, uh, where money was set aside to be able to help on the large projects. Really, it started with Cooper River Bridge and Ravenel Bridge down in Charleston. There's projects over $100 million that they can go through a process to get funding for. Um, again, coming from the general legislator, independent of uh, the federal funds, or well, I guess it helps match some of the federal funds, helps put together some of the federal funds, uh, be able to put together some of the federal funds, so that the general um, tax revenue that we're receiving from the gas tax in South Carolina can be spent on other projects. You know, at the end of the day, we still have problems. We're going to have closed bridges. We're going to have we're going to have potholes. We're going to have problems with our roads. Um, and and it's it's a challenge from the state side, it's a challenge from the legislature side, it's a challenge from the people side to be able to come up with the money. Uh, and be able to uh, prioritize what needs to be done. Um, there's never going to be enough. You know, our roads and bridges are deteriorating too rapidly, too rapidly. There's never going to be enough. And the solutions are, are multiple solutions out there. Uh, there's different ways, which way for our roads here in South Carolina. There are choices, there are challenges out there, um, but there are um, some solutions as well that we can see. And which way they go, we want to continue to improve them. Is it going to cost us a lot more? We can watch that and see that. Uh, particularly as, uh, as uh, activists here looking at this and seeing how it's going to work. In our the challenge that I see is there are rough roads ahead. There are rough roads ahead. Whether the physical roads that we're driving over or rough roads just getting things approved, um, working through the details, determining what is good and what is not, not and not so good. So with that, kind of a brief, quick overview. I don't know if you want to go ahead and uh, let the senator speak here or, or ask questions at this point, or however you want to, however you want to handle it. You want to take a few questions? I'll take a few questions. Okay.